He was still traveling through the area bringing good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he sets up the prevailing thought, Jews versus Gentiles. One was better than the other, depending on who you spoke to. The righteous versus sinners. And again, one was better than the other. And women versus men. No contest there. Then he tears it apart by simply lifting, lifting up the death and resurrection of Jesus our Christ. What he does is address inclusivity as strongly as it possibly can be. Who indeed is right with God? And God works in mysterious ways because Gary Song had the answer. The grace of God is the final answer. Saved by grace. Before we were justified, that's a legal term meaning made right with God. Once and for all, the resurrection... The human race was subject to laws before that. Included things as clean and unclean categories. You can still find them in the scripture if you want to go look. And those laws which divide people according to categories are no longer, says Paul, and why not? Because a new era of unity was ushered in with Christ Jesus. No one is to be excluded from the community of faith. Paul said it as plainly as he could. Unless we be too hard on the Galatians, we need to remember that our own history and the legions of folks considered too unclean to be a part of the church. The United Methodist Church, for instance, three main causes of prejudice in the church at all. The first one began, did you have to become a Jew in order to be a Christian? In other words, did you have to be circumcised? Notice again, it's the men that didn't talk about the women. If the Jews, men became Christians, then their women would too. But the part that really stuck in some of the disciples' craw was that having to be circumcised. Because to follow Christ, there were no restrictions. There was nothing you had to do except say, I follow. That was a restriction. And then the next thing was... Um, what race is acceptable? Every country has its fights, and that's being nice, over which race is the accepted one. We have a horrible history of our own about how we treat other races. We were getting better, but now it seems to have shifted from the slaves who were brought over, African Americans to Latinos, and then to Muslims as a religious group. And, and that's not acceptable to God. God says all are included, all are worthy of respect and understanding. Doesn't mean you have to agree with them, but you have to be respectful. And the third one is that the struggle the women have had to be full members of the faith. Fifty years ago, I couldn't be up here. Trish couldn't be up here. Kate couldn't be up here. None of us. You'd have had to wait for some other person to come along that fit the categories. It's only been 52 years or so that the first woman was ordained in the United Methodist Church. There were people before who preached. And there were people before who were in churches. But to be fully ordained in the United Methodist Church has only been 52 years. I'm 67. I was just a kid when it happened. Some of you are still going, huh? That's how long 52 seems. Paul writes, there's no longer Jew or Greek, there's no longer slave or free, there's no longer male and female, for all of us are one in Christ Jesus. Heirs according to the promises of God. We are all children of God through faith, says Paul. I found a couple stories to illustrate some of what I'm talking about. This one is about Norman Vincent Peale. As a youngster, he was shopping with his father and his father was a physician, and he gave up his medical practice to become a Methodist Episcopal Church pastor. You see, there's one of the splits, the Methodist Episcopal 
and the other side. They were walking along 4th Street in Cincinnati when a bum, what we would call a street person day, approached them. The man stretched out his filthy hand, placing it like a claw on young Norman's shoulder. Frightened and repulsed, he ran away. Dr. Peel went to his son, gave him a dollar, and instructed him to return to the man and offer him the money, but to do it in the name of Jesus Christ. Norman did as he was told, and he was surprised when the gentleman lit up his face with a brilliant smile. Traveling home that evening, Dr. Peel asked his son to describe what happened, and Norman didn't fumble for words he knew immediately. I saw the man as he really is. And his father responded, always remember and never forget it. Jesus Christ can make men and women what they can be, and we need to see them rather than what our first prejudice tells us. And that, folks, is us, too, even us. We come here this morning with various motives. Some came because your family invited you to come for church for Father's Day. Some came to socialize and visit with friends. Others came out of habit and duty. And some come because they're going through a rough patch and they're seeking some help of some sort. Some are here to say thanks to God for the many blessings and regardless why you came to church on this warm summer day, God meets us where we are and invites us, invites us to be fully the person that we are created to be in God's own image. I used to think that only I could know what that was, forgetting that God's the one who made that image. How can such a motley crew as us be unified as Paul wrote that we were. It comes down to God's love. God's love unites us. The poet Robert Browning wrote, Take away love and our earth becomes a tomb. But the tomb becomes a day of res resurrection with Christ's love. Jesus taught this truth to us through his many parables and his stories and his allegories. He warned us of being, uh, against being the ungrateful servant. He cautioned us not to be like the older brother. He admonished us for having an attitude like the first laborers hired for the vineyard. He taught us not to throw the first stone, to take the log out of our own eye before we sought the speck in the eye of our neighbor, and to pray for those who persecute us. He instructed us to turn the other cheek, to forgive 70 times 7 and go the extra mile. He asked us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to do unto others as we wanted them to do unto us. And when entering a room, to sit at the foot of the table in humility. The principles Jesus taught weren't just fancy talk. He also lived them. He invited to his table all sorts of people, Greeks, Jews, sinners, tax collectors, women, so that they all would know his grace. He befriended a man who was hated by all, Zacchaeus. He met secretly at night with a man who was confused, Nicodemus. He healed a man who had a dreaded disease, the unnamed leper. He invited women into his inner circle, Mary Magdalene for one. These principles continued to be taught and practiced in the early church. James, the brother of Jesus, told us to show no partiality between a rich man and a poor man coming into the sanctuary. And from later in his letter, Paul wrote, There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. What a beautiful an important message. We are all one in the church. In the fellowship of believers, we make no distinction between rich and poor, royalty or commoner, celebrity or ordinary citizen. And it makes no difference who we are, where we come from, what we have or don't have. It just matters whose you are. 
You're a human being to be loved and recognized. A human being brought into being by God's love. Sadly, this is a truth we haven't always acknowledged. I'm going to go there because I'm leaving next week and y'all can be mad at me long after I go if you can. Many predict the issue of homosexuality will divide and ultimately destroy the church. Our annual conference this year is a grand example of that. And the pain on both sides of the issues was pal palpable, even through streaming. The same thing was said about non-Jews, African Americans, and other slaves around the world, and women. There are many among us whose first reaction is to just condemn. And with the Orlando massacre all over the news and social media, it's not hard to hear some really ugly statements about the people killed, but also alongside those who decry such bigotry. Our division is evident. And the question is, how do you love those you disagree with? Jesus didn't say, take them home with you. Jesus said, love them. It's not a Hallmark kind of love. It's a hard work kind of love where you respect them for the people they are and wish only the best for them. And when we do that, then all the loud, negative, nasty voices quiet down. You see, when God said once for all, when Christ came once for all, that one time in history, that was all that was needed. One time for all people, forward and backward. One time for those who are to come and one time for those who are here. Christ's resurrection comes once and it comes for the same thing for all. It's not our duty to judge who has accepted Christ and who has not. That's Jesus' jo um, job. It's not our job to judge who lives the perfect life and who doesn't. That's Jesus' job. And it's not our job to hate one another when God has said to love one another. No exceptions. None. No one is left out. No one can be excluded. Living out the call to be a follower of Christ is a tough thing to do. You don't just say yes and then sit back and smile. It means you work hard in your heart and in your lives to do what Jesus told us to do. It means like any gift that we receive when we accept it, it becomes ours. If we accepted the salvation, then we also accepted what Jesus said that was hard to hear. Love one another. Include everyone. Weather forecasters, to change the subject. I love listening to weather forecasters. They can be this far apart on what they believe. They have satellite eyes in the sky that can track offshore flows and coastal disturbances, high pressure systems and low pressure cells. Yet even with all these sophisticated, complicated technologies to help, as we know, the weather report is often completely wrong. <laughs> Forecasting the weather is complicated, but living with the weather is not. No matter how complex the weather system, our best response is simple and straightforward. The complicated part is doing the simple. That's the very heart of the Christian faith. John 3.16 tells us that Christ came into the world not to contend the world, but that the world through him might be saved. When we condemn one another for whatever reason, we are not the mind of Christ. We are to encourage as Christ encourages us. If we hold that principle for us always, we will not be wrong. We will not err. God's heart is huge, more than we can ever, ever imagine. And I think that's why God wants everyone, not just some, but everyone to be saved. How they get there is none of our business. We can bring in who we can, but we don't judge. Christ does that and finds another way, I believe. When asked why she didn't give up her seat on the, on the bus, Rosa Parks declared, 
I was brought up to believe in freedom and equality and that God desires all his children to be free. Bring up a child believing that, my friends, and she or he will never be satisfied with being a second-class citizen. We have to learn that lesson for ourselves so in Christ we also may be free. Simple and straightforward, once for all, equality means equal and equal for all. And it's true because God said so. God be the glory. Amen.